Good afternoon and welcome. In my capacity as Dean of the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, it is my great privilege to welcome you to this significant public lecture sponsored by the Office of the Dean, the Office of the Associate Dean of Faculty Scholarship, the Constitutional Rights and Remedies Program at Denver Law, and the Order of the Coif. Founded in 1902, the Order of the Coif is the nation's most prestigious academic honor society dedicated to advancing excellence in legal education. Each year, the Order of the Coif supports a distinguished visitor program through which a selected Coif chapter may bring to campus a distinguished jurist, academic, or practitioner whose visit is designed to foster the exchange of ideas about an important legal or public policy matter. In 2016, Denver Law proudly secured membership in the Order of the Coif. And to celebrate this significant institutional milestone, we applied to host this year's distinguished Coif visitor, Professor Amanda L. Tyler of the University of California Berkeley School of Law. We are very privileged to be one of only three <coughs> law schools in the nation to have this distinctive honor. A nationally respected expert in federal courts, constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and other subjects. Professor Tyler earned her undergraduate degree with honors and distinction from Stanford University, where she played Division I soccer in one of the nation's strongest women's soccer programs. After earning her law degree from Harvard Law School, graduating magna cum laude, and receiving the prestigious Best Orals Award in the James Barr Ames Moot Court Competition, Professor Tyler clerked for the Honorable Guido Calabresi, my former dean, and uh, the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the United States Supreme Court. After practicing at Sidley and Austin, she entered the Legal Academy, where she has served with distinction on the faculties of George Washington University, NYU, University of Virginia, Harvard, the London School of Economics, and her current home, Berkeley Law. Over the past uh, half decade or so, she has written a number of highly acclaimed articles on habeas corpus and the suspension clause of great interest to legal historians, constitutional scholars, and civil libertarians. This pioneering work will culminate in the fall with the publication of her habeas corpus in wartime from the Tower of London to Guantanamo Bay, illustrated in front of you, published with Oxford University Press. And she, she will share an important aspect of that project today with us, involving the mass detention of Japanese Americans during World War II. As many of you know, this is a subject of great and painful significance to the state of Colorado. Over 7,000 Japanese Americans from the West Coast were sent pursuant to Executive Order 9066 to the Granada War Relocation Center in Colorado's southeastern plains. That site operated until 1945, and a barracks building, a guard tower, and the original water tower still remain, along fittingly with a memorial to the 120 Japanese Americans who served their nation and died in World War II. Ralph Carr, governor, lawyer, who had agreed to the relocation of Japanese Americans but strongly opposed internment, paid for his political career, or that decision with his political career. He was honored later in life by the Japanese government and by the naming of the Colorado Supreme Court building for that act of political courage. And lastly, and very briefly, a number of you may know that our own Denver area in of court, the Minoru Yasui in of court, was named after a pioneering and courageous Oregon trained lawyer Minoru Yasui, who was deliberately arrested in 1942 to challenge internment, passed the Colorado bar with the state's highest score in 1945, but was not allowed to practice in this state. Represented by the ACLU, he ultimately secured admission and posthumously the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This subject today is one of great national significance, one that squarely poses the limits of governmental authority with civil liberties. And it is a subject of great significance in this, our centennial state. With these preliminaries finished, it is a great privilege to welcome to the podium Professor Amanda Tyler. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. And I particularly want to thank Dean Smith for his gracious and generous introduction. It is a tremendous honor to be here at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law 
and to spend uh, what have been two spectacular days as a part of your community. Thank you one and all for your hospitality. Today, uh, as the Dean mentioned, I'm going to talk about my work and particularly about the work of several years that is culminating in my forthcoming book, Habeas Corpus in Wartime. My book project explores the English legal origins of habeas corpus and the concept of suspension as it was invented, and then traces the influence of, the, of this development as it wielded its influence over the course of early American law. The book then takes the story forward, tracing the story of habeas corpus and suspension uh, as events have unfolded over the course of American history. Throughout, the book gives special attention to periods of wartime, including most especially on the American side, the Civil War, Reconstruction, World War II, and the War on Terror. Now, where does all of this begin? It begins for the Americans with the Suspension Clause, which is found in Article I, Section 9. The Suspension Clause reads that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. Now, if you were approaching this language with a blank slate, it would be hard to know where to start in trying to interpret it and apply it on the ground. Indeed, uh, it raises as many questions, if not more, than it answers. So how do we make heads or tails of this language? Chief Justice John Marshall gave us an idea of just how to do that, and he said, when we think and talk and interpret and apply the suspension clause, we need to take account of the fact that these words used in this provision were words that were well understood at the time of the founding, deriving as they did from English legal tradition. In other words, Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall, excuse me, told me, we need to look to English tradition and that backdrop that informed uh, the dr drafting and ratification of the United States Constitution in order to find the roots of the constitutional habeas provision in American law. Now, if one doesn't look backward and instead surveys the 20th and 21st century, centuries, excuse me, one would find considerable evidence of the idea, or uh, I should say an emerging political and legal acceptance of the idea, that wartime conditions alone suffice to justify detaining citizens in a preventive posture for criminal or alleged national security purposes uh, without a suspension, to wit in a posture that is something akin to prisoner of war. Take, for example, the World War II detention of over 70,000 Japanese American citizens and over 120,000 Japanese Americans in total in camps by the U.S. government during the war. This was mandatory detention that followed mandatory evacuation orders, all of which were predicated upon a generalized collective suspicion uh, that Japanese ancestry would lead such persons to spy for the enemy Japanese empire during the war. Additional modern examples built on this episode, and they include most prominently Justice O'Connor's opinion for a fractured court in the war on terror decision in Hamdi versus Rumsfeld in which Justice O'Connor wrote, there is no bar to this nation's holding one of its own citizens as an enemy combatant. And the court, again in a fractured judgment, thereby upheld the detention of Yasser Hamdi as an enemy combatant without criminal charges for several years. More recently, in response to the Boston Marathon bombings, uh, we see the seeds laid in Hamdi bear fruit insofar as prominent members of Congress urged that the surviving bombing suspect be kept as an enemy combatant. So among other things, Senators McCain uh, and Graham and others said that the events taking place in Boston at the marathon were an attempt to kill American citizens and terrorize a major American city. Excuse me. The accused perpetrators of these acts were not common criminals, they said, attempting to profit from a criminal enterprise but terrorists trying to injure, maim, and kill innocent Americans. The living suspect, Sarnayev, based upon his actions, is clearly a good candidate for enemy combatant status. Now those voices were heard but not followed, 
at the time. Indeed, although Sarnayev was not given Miranda warnings when he was first questioned, he was quickly moved into the criminal process, ultimately prosecuted and convicted. Uh, but again, we see the seeds of this conversation pick up today. In the last few days, uh, it has come into the news that the Department of Defense is holding an American citizen who was captured in Syria fighting with ISIS. And we're waiting to hear whether the Trump administration will detain the individual as an enemy combatant or transfer him, as was done in a similar case by the Obama administration, to the criminal process. What my book aims to do is to go back and try to figure out how we got here and ask whether we took a wrong turn somewhere. As the book details, there is a wealth of historical evidence preceding, during, and following the founding period during which the Constitution was drafted and ratified that stands entirely at odds with the proposition that citizens can be held outside the criminal process in a preventive posture or as an enemy combatant in the absence of a valid suspension of the privilege. Indeed, the evidence strongly suggests that the animating purpose behind the suspension clause was to constrain the government from doing just this. In other words, the, the notion of a citizen-enemy combatant was a thing unknown to the law at the founding. Knowing, moreover, that suspension was a dramatic emergency power, and I'll say more about that, the founding generation who wrote our Constitution put strict limitations on when suspension could be declared to try and ensure that this emergency power would not be abused and would only be employed in the most dire of circumstances, to borrow from Blackstone, who was often invoked during the debates, only in extreme emergencies. But to begin our discussion, as I hinted at the outset, it is necessary to look back at where the roots of the suspension clause may be found, and that is in England. Now, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I do need to give some background to understand where we're going. The story of habeas corpus begins, as is well known, with the common law writ of habeas corpus, a judicial creation that demanded cause for a prisoner's detention from his jailer. Uh, but as English history showed, the common law writ alone was not enough to control and, and, and limit and constrain the executive in undertaking detention of his own people. Indeed, a very famous case arising out of the Thirty Years' War showed this. Charles I had been cut off by Parliament and uh, no longer was going to be given funding to pursue the Thirty Years' War. So he turned to English nobility and demanded uh, that they, quote unquote, loan him the money to pursue his objectives. Now, these forced loans met with resistance on the part of many in English nobility, including five prominent knights. Charles reacted to their resistance by throwing the five knights in fleet prison. Now, they were defended by many very celebrated lawyers, including John Selden, the great parliamentarian and legal scholar. In defending the knights and urging their discharge before King's Bench, John Selden argued that the law of the land, or this concept of due process that finds its roots in chapter 39 of Magna Carta, dictated uh, that one could not be held other than in due, under due course of law. And he defined that as to require presentment by indictment which is to presentment or by indictment, excuse me. In other words, Selden argued very specifically in the case of the Five Knights that one could not be held by the king's command alone, but only as a result of pursuing the criminal process and prosecution. Now, the Attorney General at the time, Heath, argued that Selden's arguments uh, were fanciful. Indeed, he said at one point in the proceedings, no learned man would interpret Magna Carta to require this. Heath argued instead that all justice is derived from the king and he is the font of law and justice. The knights lost. Indeed, they were denied bail and in a rather curious culmination of their story, King's Bench said, we make no doubt, but the king, if you seek to him, he knowing the cause why you are imprisoned, he will have mercy. You can guess uh, how successful that approach was. So Selden, now enlisting the support of Sir Edward Cook, pushed in Parliament for what became the Petition of Right, 
a year later. The petition of right repudiated King's Bench decision in the case of the Five Knights uh, and embraced all of Selden's arguments. But it was only a petition. It wasn't an act or statute having the full force of law. And history shows that it changed little on the ground. Indeed, to drive home the point, uh, the king threw John Selden and others in the Tower of London shortly after this, where they languished for many years. And their efforts in their own habeas pr proceedings failed when Heath, arguing, arguing again for the crown, successfully convinced King's Bench that a petition, petition in Parliament is not law. In the decades that followed, there were repeated attempts by Parliament to overturn these precedents by passing habeas legislation. In all, it took 50 years, however, for Parliament finally to do so in the English Habeas Corpus Act of 1679. Now, the Act, I'll skip ahead, I, I forgot to show you John Selden and Sir Edward Cook. And I should say, uh, in arguing for the petition of right, that Sir Edward Cook made a very powerful argument that, again, didn't, didn't change anything on the ground at the time, but in time we'll see it did. He said, we cannot yield to this, that the king should have power to commit any, and within convenient time he shall declare the cause, if it be for matter of state. Cook said, then we are gone, and we are in a worse case than ever. If we agree to this imprisonment for matters of state and a convenient time, we shall leave Magna Carta and the other statutes and make them fruitless, and do what our ancestors would never do. Again, as events show, nothing changed in the immediate wake of the petition of right. But in time, with the Habeas Corpus Act, Parliament finally came to embrace and enact legislation that embodied Selden and Cook's aspirations. The act, in other words, is crucially important to understanding everything that follows in Anglo-American habeas jurisprudence. First, it changed the law in England by <coughs> rejecting uh, the decisions in the case of the Five Knights and in Selden's imprisonment in the Tower and embracing <coughs> Selden's arguments from the case of the Five Knights. It also was part of a larger movement on the part of Parliament to rein in the executive and indeed to take control of de detention policy from the king and also at the same time, and this is another part that gets lost in the story, constrain the royal courts and force them to release prisoners where the terms of the Habeas Corpus Act were not complied with. So uh, it's also important to understand that it's the English Habeas Corpus Act that proved the foundation of American constitutional habeas jurisprudence, and I'll get to that in a moment. The statute as passed by Parliament was intended to complement the common law writ and to use the common law writ as a vehicle for its enforcement. And it included very important provisions including most especially Section 7. Section 7 of, this is a copy of the original bill. Section 7, or the Act, excuse me. Section 7 provided that for those persons taken into custody, suspected of committing any criminal activity, or who were taken into custody for national security purposes, even suspected treason, they could not be detained unless they were tried within two court terms. This is a period spanning three to six months in the English court calendar at the time. In other words, for those who could claim the protection of domestic law, detention could only follow through the criminal process when we were talking about national security or potential criminal cases. And this applied even to suspected treason and even in times of war. To, to further bolster its provisions, the act included penalties for judges who refuse to enforce its terms and grant the provided for remedy for its violations to prisoners, which was discharge. Now, because there were no exceptions in wartime, it took con uh, Congress, excuse me, Parliament, only 10 years to invent a workaround suspension. So in 1689, uh, Parliament enacted its first of many suspensions that followed in response to the activities in the wake of the Glorious Revolution. James II had been spurred to flight, but his supporters in and around London were fancying engineering his return. As a result, there was enormous political instability. And uh, Parliament, again, excuse me, invented the concept of suspension in order to respond to William's request 
that he be allowed to commit people in the Tower of London and elsewhere on suspicion of treason only. In other words, he couldn't prove treason, but he thought these people were dangerous and he wanted them imprisoned. William <laughs> went to Parliament through an emissary and requested a suspension bill so that, as he said, he could avoid having such prisoners delivered by habeas corpus, which they would have been under, then governing, uh, under the then governing Habeas Corpus Act. Numerous attempts by the Jacobites to regain the throne, combined with constant fighting with France, led to a host of suspensions in the decades that followed, with the last ones preceding the American Revolution, coming in response to the Jacobite Rebellion and the efforts of Bonnie Prince Charlie in Scotland in 1745. In every case, the king asked Parliament to give him the authority, as well as to give the authority to his Privy, privy Council, to detain individuals who were suspected of conspiring with the enemy outside the criminal process. And in every case, the suspensions enacted set aside either the English Habeas Corpus Act or its Scottish equivalent, which, is pe which was passed a few decades later. The effect of suspension was dramatic. As Sir William Whitlock once said in the House of Commons, if an angel came from heaven that was a privy councillor, I would not trust my liberty with him one moment. It was only by setting aside the act's protections that suspension could empower the executive to detain outside the criminal process. Now, Americans came in due course to learn all about these concepts. Despite reading Henry Kerr's famous treatise that listed the Habeas Corpus Act along, alongside Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights, and the English Treason Statute as the crucial guardians of English liberties, and despite reading Blackstone's commentaries, which were highly influential, uh, to glorify the Habeas Corpus Act as a second Magna Carta, Americans never knew the benefit of the English Habeas Corpus Act because the Crown consistently vetoed efforts by American colonies to enact the, uh, the Habeas Corpus Act within their own codes and claim its protections for themselves. But Americans wanted this second Magna Carta too. And as they marched toward war, they complained about being denied the trial by jury and being denied the protections of the English Habeas Corpus Act, which borrowing from Blackstone, they called the great bulwark of liberty and guardian and palladium of English liberty. They were well versed in their Blackstone. But the act very much remained in effect on British soil. And in time, that proved a serious problem uh, for the British in confronting the American rebels. So I'll tell one story to show the influence of the act and how this worked with the act in place in England and not in place in the colonies, and then we'll take the story forward in American history. So Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys are, uh, are famous uh, to kids learning about American history. They're also, it turns out, really important to American habeas history. Uh, in 1775, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys stormed Montreal in a poorly planned attempt to take the city from the British. They failed miserably, and they were quickly captured. Within days, they were put on a boat and sent to England. They arrived shortly before Christmas in 1775 and were imprisoned at Pendennis Castle. Now, Allen was something of a folk hero, and he mentions in his narrative, uh, which may be a little self-important, that people drove, or they didn't drive, they came from miles around to see him, <laughs> and he was paraded. There's no question that he was paraded around as an American rebel and prisoner. Uh, but what's interesting about Allen's case is that he spent less than two weeks in England before he was put on a boat and sent back to the United States. The question one inevitably must ask is why? Why was he sent back? Well, the answer, best I can tell, is because prominent habeas attorneys who had just represented another American put in the Tower of London successfully garnering his release in habeas proceedings had taken on Allen's case and they were fixing to file a petition for writ of habeas corpus to win his discharge as well. Indeed, going through the archival papers, one finds uh, letters written by the Admiralty Lord, uh, by one of the Admiralty Lords, after a meeting of many principal government officials, saying that the principal object is to get the prisoners, Allen and the other 
members of his cohort out of reach as soon as possible. That's why they need to be put on the first ship sailing to the Americas. Well, get out of the reach of what? The best explanation is a court that could grant them habeas relief. Indeed, as the war waged on, more and more prisoners were brought to England, and eventually the English government officials had, the British government officials had to confront the legal problems raised by cases like Allen's. At first, they consulted with Lord Mansfield, the great jurist uh, and Chief Justice of King's Bench, and he gave very important advice at the time. He said, to the extent that the American rebels claim subjecthood, they cannot be detained in a preventive posture or outside the criminal process unless there is a suspension of habeas corpus. In other words, charge the American rebels with treason and try them in due course, or be prepared, Mansfield advised, for a court to discharge the prisoners when asked to do so when they invoke the English Habeas Corpus Act. Parliament responded as it knew well how to do historically. In 1777, it enacted a suspension directed exclusively at the American rebels. Indeed, uh, Parliament directed its legislation to persons suspected of the crimes of high treason or piracy committed in America or on the high seas where many American rebels were captured, and it authorized the detention of the American rebels outside the criminal process uh, on English soil. Parliament did this expressly, as Lord North said at the time of introducing the legislation, for the purpose of treating the Americans like other prisoners of war. The suspension, in turn, uh, was extended through much of the American Revolution until the end of the American Revolution, at which point Parliament passed a new statute declaring, now confronting American independence, that the suspension would be permitted to lapse, and now the rights of the American prisoners would be addressed and governed by the law of nations, that is to say, international law, because at long last they were no longer domestic enemies of the state, but soldiers fighting for a foreign enemy. Now the book details the plight of many Americans who were held prisoner in England under the auspices of the suspension, including most prominently Henry Lawrence, who had been president of the Continental Congress. And you can see in this famous painting of Lawrence the Tower of London over his shoulder. Uh, also among those who were held uh, was the cousin of Governor, Governor excuse me, Morris. Now that name might stand out to you because he's the man who proposed the language that ultimately became the suspension clause. Indeed, his cousin was held in England under the terms of the suspension. And one could certainly wager to guess that his cousin's experience must have in influenced his thinking about these issues. Now, taking the story forward, and having this backdrop in mind, it should come as no surprise that the American experience and American habeas law was heavily influenced by this backdrop. In particular, one finds extensive evidence during the founding period uh, that the English Habeas Corpus Act was enormously influential on the early development of American habeas law, and particularly the suspension clause. So to give just some examples that show that influence, in 1776, the General Assembly of South Carolina, <coughs> newly declared independent South Carolina, took up as one of its very first orders of business uh, enacting legislation that confirmed that the English Habeas Corpus Act governed in the state. And in 1777, Georgia enacted, or ratified, I should say, its constitution and included among its provisions express language that provided that the principles of the Habeas Corpus Act shall be part of this Constitution. Now some might question which Habeas Corpus Act. To make it all the clearer, the Georgia Assembly annexed, that is to say attached, copies of the English Habeas Corpus Act of 1679 to the first circulation of the Georgia Constitution. During the Revolutionary War, many states, indeed six states, enacted their own suspensions of habeas corpus and several of those suspensions expressly suspended the Habeas Corpus Act, and, and specifically the act as it had been imported to those states. Further, after the war, in a wave of statutes, many other states adopted and codified the terms of the English Habeas Corpus Act. The most prominent of those was New York, 
which just three months before the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, adopted legislation that tracked almost word for word the English Habeas Corpus Act, including especially its important seventh section. Also in the lead up to the Constitutional Convention was Shea's Rebellion, in which Massachusetts, which by this point had constitutionalized its own suspension clause, suspended the privilege in that state to deal with the rebellion. All of this provided the backdrop against which the founding generation wrote the Constitution. And it should come as no surprise that in the convention debates and in the ratification debates, one finds extensive evidence to show that the English Habeas Corpus Act heavily influenced the way that the founding generation thought about habeas corpus and specifically how they interpreted the suspension clause. So to give one example of the influence of the English Act on that clause, in championing, championing the uh, new constitution in the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton lauded the fact that the constitution provided for trial by jury in criminal cases aided by the English Habeas Corpus Act. And indeed, uh, not long after, Chief Justice Marshall, if I can come back to him, repeatedly pointed to the English Act as the basis of the suspension clause and instructed in ex parte Watkins, among other places, that in interpreting the suspension clause, we must look to the law which is in considerable degree incorporated into our own. And he specifically pointed to the celebrated Habeas Corpus Act of 1679. Now, in the early days of the Republic, Suspension was a thing that was basically avoided by the president, which is to say, in confronting the Whiskey Rebellion, George Washington never once considered suspending the privilege and indeed gave orders to his military generals that anyone captured was immediately to be turned over to the civilian process for prosecution. Similarly, Madison subscribed to the same view during the War of 1812, and Jefferson, although he did request the first suspension to deal with the Burr conspiracy, uh, respected Congress's decision, which is to say the House's decision, not to give him what he wanted, the Senate having done so, uh, and took those who were then in military custody and transferred them to, for criminal prosecution once the suspension bill failed in the House. Now, all of this leads up to the Civil War, and because I want to get to World War II, I'm only going to say a few words about the Civil War. Uh, but there are two important things to keep in mind about the Civil War backdrop before we turn and talk about World War II. Usually when we think about suspension and habeas, we think about Abraham Lincoln, and indeed for good reason. Oh, I'll come back to that. Sorry. Skip ahead. Abraham, Win Abraham Lincoln famously suspended a head of Congress and indeed proclaimed numerous suspensions for two years before Congress finally passed suspension legislation. But he did agree with the basic proposition embodied in the Habeas Corpus Act as it had been understood over the course of English history and early American history that the Constitution in the Suspension Clause, which embraces the suspension model established in English legal tradition, makes the distinction between arrests by process of courts and arrests in cases of rebellion. In other words, suspension at, as, has as its purpose the idea that men may be held in custody whom the courts acting on ordinary rules would discharge. In other words, Lincoln agreed with all of this history. He just disagreed with who got to make the decision whether to suspend. And this was important during the Civil War because Lincoln and others believed that those in the Confederacy still owed allegiance to the Union. And on that line of thinking, not dissimilar from the way the British thought about the American rebels during the American Revolutionary War, it meant that a suspension was necessary to hold prisoners in custody without charging and prosecuting them with a crime. And in Lincoln's view and Congress's view, ultimately when it passed its own suspension legislation in 1863, these rules applied even to Confederate soldiers. So the suspensions were made applicable to Confederate soldiers. Now Lincoln uh, was very controversial for this. In this famous caricature, he's stomping on the Constitution, the laws, and habeas corpus. <clears throat> and Jefferson Davis was highly critical of this. I won't read the whole quote, but Jefferson Davis in his second inaugural lambasted Lincoln and the Union for having Bastilles filled with prisoners, arrested without civil process or indictment, uh, and 
complained that the writ of habeas corpus had been suspended by executive mandate. Now, of course, the Confederacy did, suspended the privilege just five days after this speech. But importantly, unlike Lincoln, Jefferson never claimed the power for himself. And indeed, the Confederate Congress, as an interesting point of contemporary comparison, took the position in one of its three suspensions that the power could never even be delegated to the president, much less could the first order decision of suspension be made by the president. Now this position uh, was the same as that adopted by Chief Justice Taney in the famous case of Merriman, where he said that Lincoln has essentially claimed for himself more regal power than English law gives and British law today gives the king. Uh, and, and that was very, very problematic on the view of the Chief Justice. Now, one has to be careful about celebrating Taney, who wrote some of the worst decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, but I think he was right about this. And, and without saying too much about it, I'll say that if you know as much as I've already told you about English legal history, you know that the Habeas Corpus Act was a response on the part of Parliament to take control of the law of detention and wrestle it away from the executive and also constrain the royal courts from accepting the royal command as a basis for detention. And against the backdrop of that history, which the founding generation knew all too well, and with their general suspicion of executive, centralized executive authority, it's really hard to imagine how the founding generation could have assumed that suspension was something a president could do on his own ahead of his Congress. Now I could obviously talk a lot more about the Civil War, but I want to get to World War II. Now, World War II. All of this history begs an a very important question. How on earth were 120,000 Japanese Americans detained uh, in mass detention in relocation centers or camps uh, throughout the Western United States during World War II? Now, there's a preliminary point that has to be made. The numbers include over 70,000 United States citizens of Japanese ancestry, but over 120,000 Japanese Americans were put in these camps. The number of citizens out of that 120,000 would have been much higher. Indeed, it could potentially have been the entire group. But at the time, in the 1940s, the United States naturalization laws did not allow Japanese immigrants to naturalize. They were drawn on racial terms. And so it's really important to understand that with respect to the, what I will say uh, now that follows. Now, in the wake of the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, there was a suspension in the United States, but it was limited to what was then the Hawaiian territory. On the mainland, there never was a suspension. Indeed, it was never formally proposed in Congress. My own view, which uh, I'll say at the outset, is that there's no way it could have been constitutional on the mainland. Uh, in any event, the relevant point for purposes of my talk is that without the auspices or without the imprimatur of a suspension, this mass detention policy unfolded and was implemented in the American West. The policy of forcing Japanese Americans from their homes in the West and eventually into relocation centers followed not under a suspension, but instead, as the Dean mentioned in his introduction, under the auspices of Presidential Proclamation 9066, uh, Roosevelt's infamous executive order, and the military regulations that followed under it. Now, subsequent evaluations of this episode have understandably focused on the discriminatory aspect of the policies. And it's very easy to see why. On the one hand, no such policies were directed at German Americans or Italian Americans. On the other, one doesn't have to look very hard to find evidence of racial animus directed at persons of Japanese ancestry during the period. Indeed, uh, one can read the congressional record and find uh, such evidence. And one can read the Hirabayashi case from the Supreme Court in 1943, which openly questioned the ability of Japanese Americans to assimilate into American society to find additional evidence. But as my work hopefully highlights, there was another and very fundamental problem with what happened during World War II. And it is this, the mass detention of American citizens without criminal charges and in the absence of a valid suspension was entirely at odds with everything at the heart of the suspension clause. 
Notably, it turns out, as the slide I've already put up shows, that many people in the Roosevelt administration recognized this in the months between Pearl Harbor and the issuance of 9066. Indeed, a number of significant and prominent government officials, including the Attorney General of the United States, Francis Biddle, and the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, recognized this point. Both were Harvard-trained lawyers, so they knew uh, what they were talking about, we might assume. Indeed, when the idea of internment was proposed, Biddle immediately wrote to a member of Congress and said, unless the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, I do not know any way in which Japanese born in this country and therefore American citizens could be interned. These concerns were brought to the President's attention, and this was done so on numerous occasions by numerous different lawyers and cabinet members in the administration. But in the end, none of this mattered. In the end, those in the War Department who were pushing for aggressive measures regardless of constitutionality and in the absence of any demonstrated showing of need, won out. The statement of one War Department official at the time uh, in a heated debate and, and confrontation, really, with Justice Department officials, including Biddle, exemplifies the mindset that controlled during this period. <clears throat> As Assistant Secretary of War John J. McCloy said, if it is a question of the safety of the country, the Constitution of the United States, why the Constitution is just a scrap of paper to me. Now, as my book details and the work of many others have detailed, there was also no factual premise for these policies. Indeed, several government studies in these important months had found absolutely no reason to suspect disloyalty on the part of Japanese Americans. Indeed, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was himself no stranger to robust surveillance, let's be clear, uh, <laughs> held the view that the push for internment was based primarily upon public and political pressure rather than factual data. Indeed, in, an, an, in another important report prepared by Naval Intelligence in January of 1942, uh, the author concluded that all persons of concern were already in custody or known to Naval Intelligence and or the FBI. And so, notwithstanding the massive legal problems and the serious factual problems uh, with the policies as they were being proposed, nonetheless, the military regulations rolled out in due course to require evacuation, exclusion, and ultimately internment of Japanese Americans in the Western United States. The average stay of Japanese Americans in these camps was three years. So this is an example of one of the many civilian exclusion orders that was posted. And this is an important picture uh, from Oakland, California, near UC Berkeley, where I'm a professor. This is a grocery owned by a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, uh, who was forced to sell his business and report to assembly centers and then relocation centers. Uh, these are pictures of some of the camps. This is Manzanar in California. Uh, this is a picture of children in the camps and a guard tower. Now, a number of legal challenges to the policies in Hawaii and on the mainland made their way into the courts. For his part, then California Attorney General Earl Warren, who was running for California governor at the time, and that is a big part of the story, uh, and who I should mention is a graduate of the law school where I'm a professor, and was, as the law students here know, later Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and author of the Great Brown Decision. Uh, he filed briefs as Attorney General in many of the cases, particularly the many habeas cases that came out of Hawaii during this time. His briefs are an interesting read. Among other things, his briefs argued that preventive martial law was in effect in California and justified the war measures that were directed at persons of Japanese ancestry in that state. And second, he argued, uh, this gave the military a wide range of discretion. Further, he argued, and I quote, the constitutional rights of an accused are not denied where detention by the military authorities is preventive and precautionary only. And he was referencing specifically Japanese Americans. This statement should raise more than a few eyebrows. Now as things unfolded, uh, four cases arising out of the mainland policies uh, made their way to the Supreme Court. Some of those cases the law students in the room will know well. Some of them they will not. 
uh, as the dean mentioned, one of those litigants, Yasui, uh, moved to Denver and practiced law here after the war. Uh, I'm going to talk mainly about Indo. And Indo is a case that is not taught nearly enough in law schools, uh, but is incredibly important to this body of law and jurisprudence. Endo came down the same day as Korematsu, a case that is taught, uh, but that is routinely taught as what uh, some scholars have called an anti-canon, which is to say wrong. Uh, <laughs> Endo uh, is really important to these issues. So uh, as I said, I want to talk about her in my remaining time and her case and, and put all this together. Now, Mitsui Endo had been born in California in the United States, and she worked for the state of California when the war started. Like all Japanese Americans, she was suspended from her job and essentially fired. She was also forced with her family to leave her home in Sacramento and report to a relocation <coughs> center. Meanwhile, I should note, her brother was serving with distinction in the United States Army. Her lawyer, a man named Jim Purcell, an Irish Catholic attorney from San Francisco, had done a lot of work for the Japanese American Citizens League and they brought him in to represent the fired California State employees. He also had other work for other clients through the JACL, and he went to visit one of his clients at an assembly center, which is where people reported before they were then sent to the camps. Purcell is an important person in this story because he had grown up the son of a prison guard at Folsom Prison, so he knew what prisons looked like. He went to visit this family, and he saw this family being kept in a horse stall at a horse racing facility, where the military hadn't bothered to clean the stall before spray painting it with white spray paint and spray painting over horse manure. And he, looked, he took one look at this, and he said, this is wrong. These people who have been not accused of any criminal activity are being treated worse than the convicted felons at Folsom Prison that my father guards. And in that moment, he decided he was going to challenge the entire system, the entire internment policy. He chose Indo as his perfect habeas petitioner based on a survey that he sent to all the California employees because her brother was in the Army, because she did not speak Japanese, and she had not gone to a Japanese school, and because she was a Methodist. Now, as her case made its way through the courts, the government did a few interesting things. First, it separated her from her parents, and she was in her early 20s. So they remained at Tool Lake, and she was sent to camp in Utah. Second, the government offered her release on the condition that she would drop her case. Now, if you know anything about habeas corpus, it is a reference to the body, and the prisoner has to be in custody in order for the court to issue an order directed at the jailer or custodian. In other words, the government knew, and it knew this through the course of Anglo-American history, that if you release a prisoner, any habeas corpus jurisdiction becomes moot. And they had done this with respect to many troubling, from the government's perspective, habeas cases arising out of Hawaii. So they offered Endo release, and she declined. And she declined, she said, because the fact that I wanted to prove that we of Japanese ancestry were not guilty of any crime, and that we were loyal American citizens, kept me from abandoning the suit. As a result of that, she had to stay in the camps uh, for two more, almost two more years. Now her lawyer argued to the Supreme Court in her case that ex parte Bowman, a martial opinion, and ex parte Milligan, a famous post-Civil War decision, and all really of Anglo-American legal tradition required that there be a suspension in order to hold Japanese Americans in this posture. He argued, among other things, since the military authorities have no jurisdiction by virtue of presidential proclamation to try a civilian for an alleged offense, that's what Milligan had held, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> how much less right have they to imprison a citizen without any trial at all when he or she is neither charged with nor suspected of any crime and when his or her loyalty, as in this case, is not called into question? More generally, Purcell, borrowing from Justice Davis in Milligan, argued the existence of a state of war does not suspend constitutional rights. Now, in deciding her case, the Supreme Court held that the governing military regulations required the release of conceitedly loyal citizens, and the government had made that concession as the case unfolded. Writing for the court, Justice Douglas mentioned a list of constitutional provisions, including the suspension clause, not, he said, to stir the constitutional issues which had been argued at the bar, 
but instead to explain why the court would give a narrower scope or reading to the governing legislation and executive orders at issue. Notably, the court held the decision up until after the 1944 election and until after the White House had been tipped off that it was going to lose Indo, albeit on very narrow grounds, and the White House could get ahead of it, which is precisely what happened. Uh, the White House issued uh, an announcement that 9066 was going to be repealed and that the camps would start to be closed in January of 1945, the day after that announcement, Indo came down. Now, in my view, the court's opinion in Indo, as well as Earl Warren's litigating posture on these issues, misses the forest for the trees. Throughout history, where one suspected of disloyalty could claim the protections of the habeas privilege, either under the Habeas Corpus Act or the Suspension Clause, Anglo-American habeas jurisprudence has always required a valid suspension to authorize detention for national security purposes outside the criminal process, even in wartime. Further, contrary to the suggestion of the Indo Court, it does not matter whether a person has passed a so-called so -called loyalty test or not, even assuming we could construct such a thing. The key point is that without a suspension, detention can only follow through timely criminal proceedings and ultimately a criminal conviction. As I argue in the book, we should not forget that the habeas provision was born out of a judicial writ harnessed by Parliament in the Habeas Corpus Act uh, and given constitutional sanction, uh, ultimately in the suspension clause, to constrain the executive and even, for that matter, the courts. To make it indeed that much harder for Congress to override these constraints, the founding generation constitutionalized strict limitations on when suspensions could be declared. Now there's much to be said about how such a massive violation of the suspension clause could have, could have occurred. And obviously, racial prejudice played a major role. More generally, as I argue in the book, there's pr plenty, excuse me, of responsibility to be assigned throughout the government, particularly to the president, who effectively gave his military carte blanche to do whatever it wanted. And according to Francis Biddle, uh, was not uh, particularly bothered by the Constitution. Indeed, as Francis Spittle uh, once wrote, uh, the constitutional di difficulty didn't really plague him. The Constitution has never greatly bothered any wartime president. That was a question of law, which ultimately the Supreme Court must decide. So according to Biddle, that was Roosevelt's view on these issues. Uh, well, if that's true, then we should train our focus on the courts. And indeed, I ask in the book, if the courts will not protect the privilege, who will? Or to borrow from Professor Eugene Rostow, who wrote shortly after the World War II cases were decided, it is hard to imagine what courts are for if not to protect people from unconstitutional arrest. I ask this both mindful of the long history of habeas as a check on executive authority and aware of arguments that are being made today in court, particularly now in the Supreme Court in the travel ban case by the current administration. Uh, the administration contends that it should receive deference from the courts on matters of national security. But if this episode in American history shows anything, it suggests that in times of crisis, the executive branch is poorly situated to, ch to check itself with respect to the Constitution. And the courts defer to executive branch assertions about the needs of national security at their peril. More generally, hearkening back to that quote I put up by Assistant Secretary of War John J. McCloy, there is another way to think about the Constitution as merely a scrap of paper. As Justice Tom Clark, who I should say was involved in the implementation of these military regulations during the war, working with DeWitt, uh, and later uh, served as Attorney General and, and a Justice, uh, on reflection he wrote, Constitutions and laws are not sufficient of themselves. Indeed, they are just scraps of paper, as Chief Justice Hughes once said in another famous quote. They must be given life through implementation and strict enforcement. In the end, the historical episode uh, of World War II established a dangerous precedent that has borne fruit in the war on terrorism and in the Supreme Court decision in Hamdi, upholding the notion that there is such a thing as a citizen enemy combatant. It is my hope that my work will show how instead this period in history 
should be viewed as a wrong turn in our constitutional tradition, as well as a cautionary tale of the need for courts to be especially vigilant in protecting our constitutional values in times of war. So with that, I'd like to welcome, in what little time we have left, any questions or comments from the audience. Yes, please. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe just talk for a minute about what you think, um, and this might not be as on point as you'd like to be, um, what you think uh, Earl Warren's sort of uh, motivation for acting that way in California when he was running for governor. Like, was it part of his, uh, just the political climate at the time, especially with how much he's done for, you know, criminal defendants, or he did when he was on the court um, yeah. in la later in his life. So what do you think that switch was about? Um, yeah, if you could just talk about that. So Earl Warren is a complicated man with a complicated legacy. And uh, I say this mindful that his picture is all over the law school where, where I teach. He is uh, the only justice to sit on the Supreme Court who is a graduate of the University of California Berkeley School of Law. And uh, we have rooms named for him. Uh, and, and he's routinely, you know, a champion of, of civil liberties. He wrote Brown. He wrote all these great decisions or his court issued all these great decisions in criminal procedure, um, but this part of his life is, is not one that reflects well on him. Uh, his actions uh, were very aggressive in support of the um, dislocation, evacuation, and ultimately the detention of Japanese Americans. Indeed, he was a very prominent official pushing for this. He testified before Congress pushing for this. He called together all of the prosecutors in the state of California to meet and talk about this, and they made a recommendation in favor of this. Um, he was running for office, and Judge Sugarman, who's a legal historian at Fordham, is writing a book that has uh, some material on this episode in Warren's life, and, and he's uncovered that Warren would go and meet with, with various constituencies while running for governor, and he would point to what he, his support of these policies um, to try and curry favor. Uh, with, with individuals, including other minority gro groups, which is particularly interesting. Uh, so it's, it's all, it's all uh, very troubling. I think that his efforts were born out of partly the political context, but partly, obviously, you have to, you have to look at the man himself. Um, what is interesting, uh, Ted White, has, uh, a legal historian at Virginia, has written a lot about Warren um, and what he has, uh, he's been heavily critical uh, of, of Warren for these activities and, and has argued based on later interviews with Warren that he never really apologized for his role in all of this, which is, which is a little troubling, a little troubling to put it mildly. And, and it, it's part of his story that we should tell. Yes. The deferral by the Supreme Court in the discussions with the White House about the impending Korematsu and the uh, Indo decision is troubling. Can you speak a little more to that incident and contrast it with other prior incidents or perhaps subsequent incidents where the court's done that? That, I, I know of two offhand, but that doesn't, well, I know of two where there's been coordination with the White House, both during World War II. That doesn't mean, I, in fact, I know in earlier in American history, there, there was uh, more, uh, comfortable back and forth between the White House and the court. But the two examples during the war are Endo and Ex parte Quirin. And in that case, uh, it was conveyed to the court that uh, the president would order the execution of the German saboteurs at, at, at issue in that case, regardless of whether the Supreme Court granted them relief, which created real problems as things unfolded because there was an emergency appeal in that case. And I hope this is another case that the students are reading. Um, here, it involved the military trial of, uh, I think it was eight German saboteurs, two of whom were naturalized United States citizens, one of whom continued to claim citizenship as, as the process unfolded, and they were, they were ordered executed by the military tribunal. The Supreme Court, in a rushed appeal, issued uh, an order upholding the convictions, or upholding the legitimacy of the tribunal. The convictions then followed. This all happened in the middle of the trial. Uh, but the Supreme Court didn't write the opinion for several months, and when the Chief Justice went to write it, he said something to the effect of, it just won't write, which is really problematic because the executions were take, took place five days after the original order. 
Um, so th that's a situation where I think the White House was putting a lot of pressure on the court, the same court, and, and they felt it. In Endo, uh, it's, it's pretty clear uh, that something was amiss because Justice Douglas, although he later claimed in an interview that he really wanted to issue this grand constitutional holding in Endo, uh, which could have potentially been a great decision, his notes from the conference don't actually support that. I, I pulled his notes from the Supreme Court Justices Conference right after the argument, and they read like a blueprint for the opinion that he ultimately wrote. Uh, but to his credit, it's clear the opinion was being held up, and he wrote a very angry memo to the Chief Justice asking why, if my opinion is done and we all agree she should be let out, we're holding up the opinion. And, and it's clear in context that it was being held up either for the election or to tip off the White House and let it get ahead of this, or both. And, and the likelihood is both, because while this is unfolding, Roosevelt is being strongly urged by his key advisors to close the camps. And he pushes back and pushes back until finally changing course after the 1944 election and his re-election. Other questions? Yes. Um, do you think that there's a connection between these sort of troubling logics that kind of place national security uh, above civil rights um, with regard to like 9-11 and what we refer to as the war on terror since then? So I think what we see in each of the major episodes of wartime stress, and particularly it comes up in this line of jurisprudence that I write, write about, is... Uh, a reluctance on the part of the Supreme Court in particular to engage directly with the important constitutional issues at stake, and they're all tethered to civil liberties, in the middle of the war. And then what we get are really important decisions in the immediate wake of the war, uh, whatever war that is, where the court is much more comfortable rebuking the executive and championing uh, individual liberties in our constitutional traditions. And so there are two great examples of this. Uh, the first is Ex Parte Milligan, which was written uh, a year after the Civil War and is, and is a really important decision that says you can't try civilians in military tribunals in states where courts are open and operating, and also holds that suspension does not permit military trial of individuals, which of course it doesn't. Its tradition has nothing to do with trials, but only detention. Uh, and the other great example, and I'll, I'll speak to this, is the Duncan case, which was decided by the Supreme Court in 1946, coming out of Hawaii. Now, the Duncan case is another case that we never teach our students, like Indo. And Duncan is enormously important, because in Duncan, the lead author, Justice Black, who wrote Korematsu, has totally changed his tune and rebukes uh, the military trial of civilians in Hawaii that took place under the governing military regulations that were put in place in what was then the Hawaiian territory. And he does so purportedly on, a, on the basis of interpreting the regulations, but the decision is full of language that is embracing Milligan in all its breadth. And this is important because Quirin, which was decided during the war in 1942, purported dramatically to scale back Milligan. And so Duncan has to be part of any conversation on these issues because it really puts the brakes on Quirin and it dramatically limits the reach of Quirin. Now, how does this play out in the War on Terror? You get Hamdi uh, early in, in, the, in 2004, only three years after 9-11, and at the same term you get Padilla, where the court declines to exercise jurisdiction and get to the merits in his case, which on the view of some was much harder because he was captured on United States soil, taken into custody on United States soil, whereas Hamdi was captured in Afghanistan. Um, in both those cases, you see a court that's really reluctant. I mean, I have this next slide queued up, which was to come back to Hamdi, where O'Connor upholds this idea of a citizen-enemy combatant. Uh, but then, four years later, you get Boumediene, and you get the Supreme Court really curtailing excessive behavior on their view on the part of the Bush administration and upholding habeas rights of the detainees in Guantanamo Bay. And, and Boumediene reads very differently than Hamdi. So it's another example, I think, of the, the, the more distance the court feels to the, the period of high stress in wartime, 
the more comfortable the Supreme Court has been in pushing back on the executive branch. Thank you very much. On behalf of the entire University of Denver community, I want to express my appreciation.